Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Well, Tracy, it's tick season, and it's time actually to learn how to stop those suckers. (laughs) (laughs) According to a new report from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, illnesses caused by disease-infected ticks, mosquitoes, and fleas have tripled in the U.S. in the past few years. Lyme disease is the most common illness carried by ticks, but it's not the only one. There's anaplasmosis, ehrlichiosis, what? (laughs) And even Rocky Mountain spotted fever, to just name a few. We'll get to the pronunciation of that in just a second. Well, it must be (laughs) ehrlichiosis. Here to discuss tick-borne illnesses and how to prevent them and how to pronounce them is Mayo Clinic microbiologist and parasite expert, Dr. Bobby Pritt. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Pritt. Thank you. It's great to be here. Did Dr. Shives have that right? He did. Ehrlichiosis. That's All right. correct. Why in the world are is there a tripling in the amount of diseases from these suckers, as Dr. Shives <laughs> says? Well, we have more of them. The ticks are spreading. They're spreading their ranges, and that's uh, due to a lot of different factors. Uh, some of it has to do with weather. Some of it has to do with human behavior. A lot of it has to do with hosts, like all those deer and rodents that are out there. They are perfect uh, reservoirs for the ticks to feed on. Do ticks die over the winter? No, they survive over the winter. They can hang out under the leaves and then come out as soon as the snow melts. Is Lyme disease still the most common tick illness? It is in the country and particularly in the upper Midwest and the Northeast. Some 300,000 cases a year, right? Yeah, more than that. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. It, but when we were a, a decade ago, a couple of generations ago, no, I'd never heard of Lyme disease. Is it because it had not been diagnosed yet or because there was no Lyme disease at that point? There was some disease, so it had been diagnosed by then, but there wasn't a lot of it. Uh, there weren't as many uh, forested areas where our deer used to like to hang out. We used to be more of a farming society. There used to be wider areas that were just open fields for crops. Now we have all these nice wooded areas that the deer just love, the rodents just love. That's a perfect habitat for ticks. And we love to go out into those beautiful green spaces. And and our behavior also drives this. We want to go out and go for a hike in the woods, and we should. It's just now we have to be aware that those ticks and the mosquitoes and the fleas are out there, and we have to be able to protect ourselves. So we get it from the tick that bit the deer. Yes. Well, actually, it's usually the mouse that it gets it from. So the tick is born not infected with Lyme disease. But then when it bites its first mouse or small rodent, it becomes infected. And then in order to change into its next life cycle stage, it needs to take another meal. And that could be from us. Hmm. Well, what, what's it, what do deer have to do with it? You know, the deer are actually more of just a, a blood source. They're a food source. The ticks like to feed oh, on deer, but deer themselves actually don't get infected with Lyme disease. Well, it's the mice. We can't blame the deer. <laughs> <laughs> deer are also part of a life cycle, though, for some of the other things like anaplasmosis and ehrlichiosis. When it comes to ticks, is that what the problem is, or what are what are other diseases that ticks spread? Well, as you mentioned, Rocky Mountain spotted mm-hmm. fever, anaplasmosis, there's babesiosis, Borrelia miyamotoi, that's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> um, there's also the two nic- uh, new tick-borne diseases that we identified here at Mayo Clinic, Borrelia mayonii, named after the Mayo brothers, yeah. and also Ehrlichia murus. So there have been nine new pathogens spread by ticks or mosquitoes just identified since 2004. Is one of those the ones that results in an allergy to meat? Yes, that's a, a really odd one, and people get a really bad anaphylactic reaction if they eat meat if they're bitten by a certain type of tick. Amazing. I know. Lyme disease, the most common one. So let's say that you know you have had a tick on your body or you don't. What are the symptoms? What do you look for for Lyme disease? Fever is one, and rash. Those are two big ones uh, for all the tick-borne diseases. Is this the rash that that looks like a target? For Lyme disease, it's that so-called targetoid rash. The problem is is not all people have that. It could also be in hard-to-see areas, like if it's on your scalp, under your hair, or on your Uh back. That's why tick checks with a friend are sometimes helpful. Uh, Have someone look in the spots that you can't easily see. But even if you don't have a telltale rash. If you have other symptoms, you should go to the your doctor. Fever, rash, what else? Uh, you could have body aches, muscle aches. Those are the big ones, joint pains. 
And then how, uh, if, you, if you have those symptoms, go to the physician, how do they diagnose it? How do they know if you have Lyme disease? There's a few tests we do. For Lyme disease, we look for antibodies that your body forms as part of its immune response to the organism. So that's called serologic testing. PCR is not a big part of Lyme disease but we uh, testing, but we do offer it as more of an adjunctive test. For other diseases, we have PCR tests, we have serology. So we have a number of ways in the laboratory that we can detect these. Blood tests, and they can be pretty definitive. They can, yes. Okay. Are there any advances being made in the battle against the ticks? Yeah, it's interesting that you ask that because there's a whole new tick-borne disease working group that was sponsored by the um, government, which I'm actually on one of the subcommittees uh, working groups, and we are looking at all of those things. What are the gaps in our existing technologies, and then what are some of the new technologies that can help fill those gaps. There's a number of different things being looked at. Some will be going through the FDA for approval, but nothing's really here yet. So we're still unfortunately relying on technology from the 1970s and 80s, like serologic testing. Well, and the tricky thing is back in the 1970s, for instance, if you were gonna go out into the woods, you didn't think twice. Right. Not maybe at the most, you just looked for ticks on your body when you got back, mm -hmm. but times have changed. And so before you go into the forest or through a walk in a meadow or whatever yeah. the case is, what you should we do? You have to think about these yes. things. Exactly. If you're going to go out into the woods and you think you're going to go off the beaten trail, you need to be applying some sort of tick or insect repellent. We recommend DEET. Anything with 30% DEET or more, there's also picaridin. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency actually has a whole list of all the different options. And uh, there's also permethrin that you can spray on clothing. Essentially, the idea is choose what you're going to be using and then make sure you do it consistently. You could also do some simple things like tuck your pants into your socks. <laughs> Less bare skin for those ticks to grab onto. All good, uh, good thoughts. Uh, so you talked to us about the symptoms of Lyme disease. You talked to us about the diagnosis. Now tell us about treatment uh, and if it's important to be treated. And if you don't get treated, uh, or even sometimes if you do, the complications. Yeah, so treatment's important. And if you think you have a tick-borne disease, you definitely want to go to your physician. Some of these diseases are life-threatening. Things like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, that's life-threatening. In children, in adults, ehrlichiosis can be life-threatening. Usually, the treatment is a drug called doxycycline. Even for children with cases of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, a lot of times we say don't give certain antibiotics like doxycycline to children. That is not the case with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So usually, antibiotic treatment is required. And most cases, patients will respond if they're treated early. If they're not treated early, uh, complications can arise. Like with Lyme disease, the disease can disseminate. It can go to your joints. It can go to your nervous system. And th that Even can Even your heart, right? It can go I mean, to your heart. heart. People have died of Lyme endocarditis. So it's important to find out if you have it, get a definitive diagnosis, and be treated and er as early on as possible. Exactly. Is it ever too late to undergo treatment? <sighs> It's less effective. So I wouldn't say it's too late. You'd still want to go to your doctor and see what your treatment options are, but it may be less effective. All right, DEET, 30%. Uh, <laughs> put your pants in your socks. Make yep. sure your arms and uh, legs are covered. Everybody's doing it, or at least they should be. They should be. <laughs> yeah, or stay out of the woods. <laughs> We've been talking about tick-borne illnesses and prevention with Mayo Clinic microbiologist and parasite expert, Dr. Bobby Pritt. Thanks once again for joining us, Dr. Pritt. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Pritt.